All right. So the first order of business before I forget is I need a VP to volunteer to take minutes for us tonight. Anybody? It's like it's gotta be somebody in the audience there's no VPs in the room. <laughs> I'll take minutes, Charlie. Who? All right, this is Don Foley. I'll take the oh, minutes. Don. Okay. Thank you, Don. You're not even a VP and you volunteer. What a guy. Okay. So, as usual, we're going to have our guest speaker tonight, and uh, then we'll have some various officer reports. And our guest speaker is somebody that we're very familiar with, that being Nora Vance who is, uh, among many other things, the observatory director here, over here at EMU. Uh, it's rather ironic, we were a little concerned about having more than 20 people in the room. And it turns out we've got, what, about six, <laughs> seven total. So maybe everybody was afraid that they would come and not be able to get in, I don't know. <laughs> well, you still got time. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so a lot of people have been here know all the resources that Norm has here and, and the life he really lives, how spoiled he is. <laughs> Frankly, he's got so much equipment, it's absolutely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you that haven't, uh, and we do have one person here, it's a new club member, by the way, Howard Ritter. Uh, so this is the first time he's got to see this facility. But uh, it is quite the facility and uh, Norm really does have uh, a lot of stuff over here. Uh, next year, hopefully, we'll be back again, and hopefully, you can make it. We don't have any restrictions. We can really get a chance to check all of this out. So tonight, Norm is going to talk to us about a few things here at Eastern Michigan, and then move up into some of the areas in Northern Michigan. Give us an update on many things, telescopes, and astronomy related. So with that, take it away, Norm. Oh boy. Uh, so Jeff, I got a. Go to screen, share screen mode here. Share screen and yeah. the, share your, uh, the one down below the power. That one. Yeah. There we go. And uh, we are in business. Okay, and I'll go to slideshow. How's that looking? Beautiful. All right. I did something right for a change. Wow. So hopefully, uh, Jim, you're the closest to me on the screen here. So if you nod your head, if you can hear me clearly, then uh, then you're fine. We'll proceed. Okay. I, I just see a, a mouth. I'm not hearing things because, uh, again, I'm plugged into a HTML. And uh, okay, thank you. Um, my presentation was just a, a usual Norb Vance potpourri of slides that uh, I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, from uh, recent exploits up north. And uh, many of you, if not most of you, have probably been to some of these places, so it's sort of a refresher. Or um, um, if you haven't been up there, then uh, this is a, a, a summons to go up and uh, check out a couple of the places that are pretty cool up there for astronomy. And uh, that's uh, all been done within the past month. Um, I also was prepared here to uh, show folks uh, a little bit about the observatory, uh, assuming they were in the, the Zoom audience and not familiar with what we have over here at Eastern. So I'll zip through these a little bit uh, quicker than ordinarily. Uh, but I did start with this slide because I, uh, one of the presentations I did um, up north was at the Headlands. And uh, I wanted to let a few folks up there know that I had just uh, received a, an Orion six inch in telescope. And these things are cumbersome. Where do you where do you put them? Uh, a a uh, picnic table. They're very awkward to use uh, unless you've got some kind of a narrow stand to support them on. So I came up with this ingenious use of a, a unused tripod and a piece of plywood, and uh, glued it all together and, and screwed it on. And uh, boom, a base for my in telescope six. And uh, it worked so well that uh, even Spock and Kirk approved. So I just threw that, uh, yeah, see, uh, Spock said it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, there it is, yeah. What is that, he says. So uh, anyways, that's uh, a go. And I've been using scopes, as you see in the picture here, uh, since I was a young lad, my Uncle Ray was uh, 
one to push me for uh, astronomy. So that scope is sitting across the hall and those folks here will get to see the scope that I've had since uh, 1966, a classic TASCO Newtonian. So here we are at uh, EMU Scherzer Observatory. Uh, this is a clear night. They do happen on occasion, just not tonight, doggone it. Um, 10 inch APO sitting under the dome. This by the way is the view the Blue Angels are getting of the observatory. They are flying over the building practicing for a thunder over Michigan. And uh, we can stand on the deck and watch the Blue Angels fly over. Uh, it's actually a drone shot from one of our instructors, Jake Landy, uh, which is a neat perspective to show that we have the main dome and a secondary dome with a, a, a Celestron 925 uh, photography instrument in there with the cameras on board, uh, all controlled from a room just below. And you'll see that here in a moment. And here's the nighttime view, which is, looks so pretty because of all the pretty lights. So one of the drawbacks of being on a campus observatory in proximity to millions of people in Southeast Michigan, you got lots of light pollution. So we have to deal with that. So part of the um, uh, beauty is uh, to have, <laughs> yeah, Jeff's uh, pointing at something on the screen here. Um, part of the beauty of uh, being close to the students is that you get a lot of them here. If we were off in the boonies somewhere, then uh, be a little tougher to get to. So that's our observatory at night. And then inside the dome, of course, is the 10 inch uh, apochromatic refractor uh, since 1991. So we're gonna give the folks here a little tour here in just a bit. I uh, found these two nostalgic pictures while I was sorting through my slides preparing this. That's me in 1991 as a spry young lad, half my age, uh, standing next to the equatorial head, the uh, uh, $37,000 equatorial head, $1991, and Kevin Daney looking uh, thin and uh, young uh, next to the pier, 300 pounds worth of pier, 500 pounds worth of equatorial head. Add it all together, you got a thousand pound refractor. So mm -hmm. that'll that be awesome. Mount. That's a buyer's mount, series three, and uh, they still make them. And up on the deck, of course, we have plenty of other telescopes, a shed full of them, the secondary dome, and uh, C8s galore for uh, student use. So it's a fun place to hang out. Uh, uh, Strong Hall next door is the Department of Physics and Astronomy headquarters up on the top floor, just underwent a $40 million renovation. We're very happy to uh, be in this building. Unfortunately, COVID came and uh, it's been empty for two years. So hopefully in the fall, we'll come back and uh, get things rolling again. And right next to it is Strong, um, Mark Jefferson with the Sphere. Uh, more on that in just a moment. Inside Strong Hall, though, we have the uh, atrium, which is all new. Everything's new, right from the ground up. Uh, the, all they left behind was the steel and um, uh, steel pillars and concrete floors. Uh, I like to call these the Saturn lights in the atrium. Pretty, pretty cool place. But as Charlie mentioned, I'm pretty spoiled. Uh, I also operate the machine shop. And uh, you can see here a fleet of telescopes that I uh, get to work on now and then. I bring scopes in and uh, play with them. Uh, the telescope to the right is the Astronomy Club telescope that appeared in Sky and Telescope magazine back in 1989. When we took it to Stellafane, they took a picture of it and thought it was pretty cool, the disk drive telescope. It's now sitting down in the shop after spending a couple of decades out at Fish Lake. So it's a, a fun telescope as well, 10 inch uh, Newtonian. Um, the secondary dome has a uh, 9 925 Celestron imaging scope with a 60DA camera on it for astrophotography. Even in the city, we can get things done. And here's Miles Mercier who uh, helped uh, restore it uh, with my uh, uh, guidance um, over the past uh, few months. We've gotten it back and running again. It was covered with you know, every conceivable cobweb when uh, it sat for two years during COVID. And uh, this is our little offering of classes on the upper left as part of the astronomy minor. And over here on the right is a picture of the control room where Miles is sitting at the computer that runs everything above, the little domes above. And then there's the Alvin Clark. And most folks know that uh, we have this historic instrument uh, across the hall that Thomas Edison looked through at one point during a, an interesting little expedition out to Wyoming during the 1878 eclipse carried out by James C. Watson of U of M astronomy fame. So a neat historic instrument. It's got some provenance as we say. Um, there you can see the football lights in the distance. Yes, we've got to deal with all these campus lights and occasionally a football game. So that's cool. And here's the planetarium, the sphere, which sits above a four-story atrium in our Mark Jefferson Science Complex. And the cool thing about that is that we're just 
going to upgrade the projector here in the next few weeks. The PO was submitted today, so we're excited about that. The, the order went in, so uh, tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, we're pushing 100,000 for this projector, um, which is cheap in projector talk. So we're gonna have a new, brand new projector, higher resolution, and uh, we're excited to get that thing up and running. And here's some of the characters in our story. Uh, in fact, Rosie is sitting here. She's uh, one of our astronomy club officers. She's uh, now getting um, uh, accustomed to the uh, U of M planetarium under the gui uh, guidance of uh, Buddy Stark uh, and is interning over there. So she's with us. I'll uh, mention a few things about Joe Brousseau here. Many of you know Joe Brousseau. Uh, he's been around and then of course, uh, John and James Ehlers and uh, Martin. Grassman and uh, our astronomy club president Miles, and then this Cooney guy, and then of course Gerald Kevin and Jack uh, Underwood. So, a few of these guys we mentioned along the way. So let's get to the trip. Uh, I went on vacation with uh, dear uh, sweetheart Kathy up north to um, uh, Sleeping Bear Dunes and Mackinac Island and Sutton's Bay, Traverse City, and the Headlands International Dark Sky Park. Uh, part of the vacation to give a talk or presentation up there about a special person here in just a moment, you'll see that. But along the way, we're um, uh, revisiting uh, Sleeping Bear Dunes, which I hadn't seen in years. And no, I did not go down to the lake. I read the sign, okay? And I especially read this part because they would have had to rescue me uh, 3,000 bucks later. They would have hauled me back up from the uh, lake shore below. So uh, it's quite a, quite a climb down there, but it's uh, absolutely breathtaking views from the shores of Lake Michigan. But here's a neat little secret. Some of you may be aware. I know, Doug, you've been up there. You're living up there in Traverse City and uh, have some history with this place. But uh, Enerdine's a little science store, one of the coolest science stores in the Midwest, if I may say, uh, where they sell telescopes uh, galore. Uh, Dick uh, Cookman was a former astronomy professor up there, I think Northwestern College, something uh, in those uh, lines. And uh, he's the proprietor of this uh, fine collection of telescopes. Look at this. You walk in here and it's like I said, a kid in a candy shop. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And, and uh, only partially displayed here is a wall full of Teleview eyepieces. Top to bottom Teleview. Ah, we just had Adrian walk in here. So we got uh, another visitor. So Adrian's here. Um, but wall to wall telescopes and uh, Teleview eyepieces. Uh, I'd say there's a few thousand dollars worth of uh, telescopes in there. And this is the front display. <laughs> Uh, their latest being the, uh, the newest Celestrons with the uh, uh, cell phone cameras on back. So, uh, boy, it was tempting. Uh, I cannot walk out of there without buying something. So in this, in this case, I needed a mount for my C5 back home. And here you can see it. While I was on vacation, I bought a $300 SLT go-to mount for my C5 and had it shipped home rather than carry it around. So uh, there it is uh, downstairs in our shop uh, upon arrival. So... Uh, it, like I see, you just, you go in there, you got to spend money. You just got to, mm -hmm. okay. Um, up in, <laughs> yeah, helping the mission economy, yes. Uh, helping uh, or uh, heading a little further north, uh, we'll go into uh, St. Ignace. My good friend Dave Black is up there uh, next to the Murdoch Spud Shop. If you're ever in St. Ignace, be sure to stop in and say hi to Dave. He's an EMU alum and took my course back in uh, 1987, somewhere in there. Anyways, he's got connections with the Bridge Authority, and back in 2006, uh, he got me uh, permission to go up to the top of the North Tower of the Mackinac Bridge, so I show that here, and that's a spectacular view. So Dave's got connections, and if you want to know anything about where to go and what to see in the UP, stop into his store and check it out. He's got some uh, cool uh, uh, imagery, and um, I, I don't want to say I taught him uh, photography, but I introduced him to the uh, uh, fine art of darkroom work back in the late 80s. And uh, there was a car show in St. Ignace, and I'm a big AMC fan, and check out that Matador Coupe from 1974. Cool. Uh, what, a, what a zoo of people there. But uh, the real story of setting up in St. Ignace was to visit the Headlands, and here's the latest and greatest staff. There's been a lot of turnover in the Headlands, as some of you may be aware, uh, but this is the latest crew, and they seemed pretty uh, capable and excited about getting things uh, set on the right course. Uh, the Headlands has had a little misdirection and some issues and finance uh, questions and so forth, people coming and going. But uh, this crew seems very capable and uh, the um, director of Headlands in particular is uh, uh, Jamie here, Jamie Westfall. 
and um, she was uh, quite excited about uh, uh, the latest uh, uh, talks and stuff that are going on, the latest activities. Um, and alongside him, uh, her is um, Austin uh, Levine from Emmett County. And so he are sort of oversees operations there as well. And helping out in astronomy is uh, this young man from CMU. He's 21 years old, just turned 21, and he's the paid astronomer on staff there. He's an astronomy student, and he's the guy that runs the show. Are you guys jealous? Yeah. He's 21 years old, and this kid's out there talking to crowds and entertaining them with CPC 11s and so forth. Uh, uh, what a job. And uh, next to him helping out is volunteer uh, Mick uh, from the uh, Northern Michigan Astronomy Club. So uh, you'll likely see these kind of folks um, at the Headlands if you visit there at one of the many offerings that they have uh, for observations, which are typically, as I understand, on Monday nights, or sorry, Wednesday nights and Saturday nights, uh, they have scopes set up. Uh, in the dome is a 20 inch plane wave telescope that's uh, been out of commission for a while, but Joe Brousseau, good old Joe, expert that he is in photography and telescopes has been driving up from his home near Saginaw, near Kalkalan, and uh, helping out to get this scope back up and running. And they've nearly got it there. So within the next month, I'd say, I'd say Joe is probably going to be having it going. I'll talk to him in depth about uh, their, their um, uh, success uh, when I see Joe at Fish Lake in just a few weeks when we're what up at Fish Lake. What was the problem so, with the telescope? Uh, it's a 20-inch plane wave. It is not a scope you look through. You can see on the back there's a ZWO cameras, and that's all fed to monitors down in the visitor center below. Uh, but uh, uh, it's going to be back up and running soon. Here's, here's the Northern Michigan Astronomy Club group uh, setting up scopes. They have two CPC-11s uh, on the fork mounts, Altazi fork mounts, sitting on the uh, patio the, at the pavilion which you'll see here in a second. And uh, sort of the guy in charge really besides Andrew is uh, uh, NMAC uh, member uh, Rod Courtright. So he's the guy that uh, really runs the show uh, from there. He lives in Boyne City, so he's not too far of a drive. Adam, uh, Andrew drives up from Petoskey, 45 minute drive just to get to work. And you can imagine how fun that is uh, in the fall weather, but he's the guy that uh, uh, handles the scopes. And here he is setting up the CPC-11 uh, for evening observing. And a typical night, you might have 100 people show up uh, on these things, and they've had occasion to have over 1,000 show up at these gatherings up there. So it is a hugely popular place. Uh, I don't think Emmett County appreciates just how popular this place can get. And uh, I think that's... Uh, uh, conservative numbers. They, they get people in there every night looking. It was, uh, when I was to do my talk, it was raining outside and we still had uh, several dozen people show up uh, wanting to take a look at the sky, but to, we had to inform them that it ain't going to happen. So uh, pretty neat. Um, look in the shed underneath the dome and they've got all kinds of scopes in there. There's a Takahashi in the back, but look at this Mondo Lunt. This scope's got to be 10 grand. This is one of their biggest Lunt H alpha scopes right there. So it's a beast sitting on a C gem mount. Pretty cool. Huh? So uh, they got quite the collection of scopes, including the plane wave up in the dome. And uh, I think they're well geared for astronomy. I brought a scope, but I didn't even take it out of my car when I saw all this. I wasn't sure what they had. So here's Rod getting the uh, uh, people that are arriving uh, early for um, uh, uh, an agenda for what's going to happen. And uh, as we patiently wait for the sun to set, um, we were debating who's going to give the talk to the crowd, and uh, they're looking around. Rod usually gives some of the talks, um, and uh, they were going to hand the microphone to somebody, and guess who was standing there just sort of twiddling his thumbs? Yeah, they, they hand it over to me. No script, no program, but then again, I've been doing these kind of talks for years, so they threw the microphone at me, and before you know it, there's 100-plus people sitting there on the hillside, maybe more. Um, all hanging on my uh, uh, tour of the sky. They let me use a laser pointer. So I, I went off and did a 40 minute uh, freelance uh, presentation on what's going on in the night sky. And then after I was done, I walked up into the audience and was chatting from, uh, with people from Ohio and Florida and all over the place. So it's, it's quite a popular place. It's pretty cool. It really is a, uh, a magical place to do astronomy and to uh, meet and greet people that are excited, enthusiastic about it. Um, a, a real good night, they'll have cars backed up out the road to the main road and they'll walk a quarter mile to get into the place, uh, even a mile 
to get into the place to uh, check out what's going on. So pretty neat. And uh, I know Adrian, you're here. If I had had a uh, guiding base in your techniques, uh, the Milky Way would have been far better than what you see here on my, my little uh, feeble attempt at the Milky Way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it, it, yeah, it blows away. Yeah, it, it blows away anything you can get in the thumb of Michigan. The skies are definitely dark there, but uh, we're going to talk about someplace even darker here in just a second. So the Headlands is a designated international dark sky park. And yes, the Milky Way is beautiful. And yes, uh, there's very little light pollution. There's some light domes in the distance, but um, uh, it is very worthy. Now, the reason I went up there, and I'll be brief about this, I just threw in some of my notes that I did for uh, the audience presentation in the uh, event center, was uh, to celebrate uh, the work of Annie Jump Cannon, one of uh, uh, the women uh, Harvard computers, as they call them, that uh, worked at the Harvard Observatory. And uh, she is credited for thousands of discoveries and uh, mainly the classifications of stars. And it is 100 years ago this year that the International Astronomical Union celebrated the uh, classification scheme that we now are so familiar with, the uh, OBA fine gentleman kiss me uh, spectral class sequence that uh, everybody uh, is so familiar with. So Annie Jump Cannon made several major discoveries, and I noted some of them here in my talk, and gave a little highlight or two about her uh, history at the Radcliffe College and the Harvard Observatory, and the fact that uh, Edward Pickering picked her as one of the computers uh, that would uh, be tasked with the uh, 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 information, the data that was being generated at the observatory. And there's some other familiar names that uh, you'll recognize, Wilhelmina Fleming and Henrietta Leavitt, uh, Antonio Mori, Winlock, and uh, so forth, on down the list, each one of them uh, coming up with some major discoveries. Uh, Henrietta Leavitt, uh, uh, with her work on uh, Cepheid variables, was uh, instrumental in that uh, discovery as well. So pretty cool group of people doing some amazing stuff. And again, some of her many accomplishments, um, working on the spectral classes, um, classifying over 350,000 stars, discovering five novae, and uh, even a spectroscopic binary along the way. And uh, again, the IAU was the one that uh, uh, solidified this classification scheme 100 years ago. A few other little interesting notes about her, the fact that she uh, was uh, uh, awarded uh, three honorary doctorates, but never got a doctorate directly and yet made all these important contributions when she was a professor of astronomy at Harvard until uh, 1940 and uh, uh, fought for women's rights in, uh, in a number of arenas, including science. She trained many people. And one of the people she trained was good old Cecilia Payne here, who went on to uh, produce as Otto Struve once said, the most uh, amazing uh, PhD work in the thesis in astronomy, in his opinion, uh, primarily noting that stars are uh, comprised of mainly hydrogen and helium, uh, something that was rejected outright by many scientists, including Henry Norris Russell. They didn't want to believe that uh, stars were only or primarily hydrogen and helium. They thought they'd have equal amounts of chemical elements, just like you'd find on the earth. So much for that idea. So one person, and here's another important person in her life, the, uh, the woman that got her started at Wesley Co College in astronomy. And then, then of course, Pickering and uh, Henrietta um, uh, adding up uh, uh, to quite a mix of people in her past. So that's what my talk was on. I, I discussed uh, uh, things like the HR diagram and uh, you know, where our sun fits into the grand scheme of things. And I've been fascinated with these since I was a kid. Uh, I share this with you because I used to make little guidebooks before there was this thing called the internet. I used to uh, have to uh, uh, dig it for information and books. And rather than having five books, six books sitting out there next to my Tasco telescope, I uh, assimilated them into uh, these little booklets with star charts and everything else. And here's my HR diagram when I was 11 years old. So uh, if you look at it carefully, there's a, a couple of boo-boos here and there, but don't, don't look too close. Uh, moving on, moving on. Uh, the other book here is uh, uh, another favorite that I found in my school library. I think I wore out the cover by uh, uh, checking it out uh, each and every time I could get it. Um, uh, ABCs of Astronomy from 1962. What a great book. 
by Roy A. Gallant. I, I doubt if he's still with us these days, but years ago when I was working here at Eastern, I called him and told him, and I said, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Gallant, because uh, this is uh, the book that helped get me into astronomy, and uh, I now teach at a university thanks to your efforts. So he was quite pleased to hear that. He was at the University of Southern Maine, as I recall. So pretty neat uh, book and uh, pretty fun stuff. So I was excited about uh, things like star size. I couldn't believe it when they said stars like Betelgeuse and Antares were these giants. So uh, it, it fascinated me. It also helped that there was this neat show on TV at the time in the mid 60s uh, called Lost in Space. <laughs> I, was, I was waiting for people to say Star Trek, but I didn't find Star Trek until it went into syndication. What was I thinking? I didn't hear about Spock or any of that stuff till 1970, but no, the stupid warning, warning, Billy Mummy and Dr. Smith uh, got me thinking about space, but uh, uh, boy, uh, don't we know better now. But uh, yeah, it was cool. Now, one of the things I did at the uh, uh, Headlands was to uh, send people out with uh, sheets that had some of the bright, colorful stars since we're celebrating car star colors. I picked out a handful of stars that I'd have the guys aim their telescopes at to show the guests uh, these colorful stars. And many of them were very familiar with. Um, Alberio, of course, don't sing Hail to the Victors, please. Uh, and then uh, Antares, Mu Cephei, the Garnet Star, 61 Cygni, has a very nice color rendition because it's a K-class dwarf uh, binary system. You can definitely see the yellow and cork has got pretty colors of uh, Ross Elgathia, red giant. But uh, uh, I was uh, emphasizing the fact that we got blue giants out in the spiral arms and the yellow uh, giants in the uh, interior lighting up galaxies, that kind of fun thing. But here's one that really takes the cake on color. In my opinion, it's right overhead, T. Lyrae right near Vega, about uh, as red as they get, a carbon star that uh, shines like a red LED in, in the sky. So people are really amazed to see how deeply red uh, stars can be. And uh, that's one of the best in the sky. So here's the list I handed out. I uh, sort of made this my business card for the people who were there and hand, was handing these out uh, left and right. And uh, folks could uh, walk off with this list of the, the prettier color stars. It's not comprehensive, of course, but it gives you a good idea of what's going on. And during my talk, I gave away another telescope. I love giving away telescopes. Uh, if I can afford, I'm not giving away C11s, mind you, but uh, I, I gave away one of these little uh, uh, Celestron 70 millimeter jobbies and uh, an 11 year old kid from uh, Gaylord won it. And he, he was uh, an enthusiastic young man. So I gave him a field guide as well to go with it. So we'll see where he goes with his little, new little telescope that uh, he won as a door prize at the uh, at the event. Now, more recently, i.e. last week, uh, Kevin Daney and I decided we are going to Beaver Island. We'd never been there. Uh, we were excited about it. I know I was talking to Jack uh, Brisbane here just a short time ago. Uh, he was there years ago and has some pretty cool stories about the place, but um, I'm Beaver Island deficient. And so was Kevin and we definitely wanted to go out there. So we took advantage of a uh, astronomy course offering from Central Michigan University at their field station through uh, Professor uh, Aaron Lecluse, or Clues as they like to call him, as he likes to be called. And so we loaded up Kevin's van with my C11 and his 13 inch dob, 13.1 inch, and uh, headed off uh, for the two hour boat ride over from Charlevoix um, uh, on the Emerald Isle uh, ferry with uh, Kevin's van filled with telescope stuff. And it turns out we had the biggest scopes in the whole thing there. They have a one lonely C, uh, C8 at the field station and uh, an old Edmund telescope. <laughs> so you would think they would have something a little more robust there, but uh, we were the talk of the town. In fact, we were the talk of the town. People came out and wanted to see uh, what was going on. And uh, I went into a gift shop on the day of our departure and the lady there had heard about a couple of astronomers who were out at the field station. So news travels fast on the island. But uh, here's uh, Clues and his wife, Jen, and uh, Kevin uh, on the ferry on our way out to, for the two hour ride. And if you're not familiar with Beaver Island, it is sitting out here in Northern Lake Michigan, um, actually about due west of Cross Village and a little bit further south than the Headlands Dark Sky Park up here and uh, due north of Traverse City, right up straight out of the uh, Traverse Bay. 
and it's uh, about a 32 mile boat ride, two hours out here. And I think about 12 miles separates it from the mainland here. Uh, so it's, it's definitely dark skies and you'll see why here in just a moment. Um, they do want to make it an international dark sky sanctuary. They've been trying for a couple of years here. Here's their argument. You can go online and request their dark sky status PDF that they've uh, put together to hopefully get this designation. Uh, Michigan's rich with dark sky parks, but uh, frankly, uh, I can only think of the Sini Wildlife Refuge as being nearly as dark uh, as Beaver Island. You're going to see why here in just a moment. It is pitch black out there uh, when you get to the south end of the island. Uh, most of the businesses and so forth takes place. People live on the north end. It's uh, pretty well developed uh, along certain roads, but still a lot of woods, a lot of uh, pristine uh, uh, forests and so forth scattered about. Real nice beaches here and on the North Shore. This is St. James Bay and the little town that you get to when uh, you access the uh, uh, island through the ferry. Uh, there's a couple of airports. Uh, the busier airport is uh, a little bit further uh, south. Uh, not this one, but uh, oh, this one here, uh, the Welke Airport. That's the busy one. And you pass it on your way to the CMU Biological Field Station, which is part of Sand Bay. Quite, quite a pretty uh, drive. And the roads turn to dirt. As soon as you leave this area up here to the north, everything is dirt further south. So it's uh, concrete roads, but this is arriving at St. James Harbor. CMU operates a uh, research vessel. Uh, that's expensive. I mean, they've got a respectable field station. It, it rivals anything U of M, MSU, and uh, certainly uh, puts ours to sort of shame at uh, Lapeer. But uh, they took over the old Coast Guard station, have a research vessel hiding in the it says Central Michigan University there, but this is St. James Harbor. And across the way are the docks, and this is what you see when you arrive. Looks like something out of the Old West. Cute little town, uh, buildings that are 100 plus years old. And so pretty cool. So that's uh, the, the St. James uh, area of the town. Um, there's some uh, one store, one grocery store, one hardware, uh, just a couple of hotels. The uh, Emerald Island uh, Hotel is probably the nicest of them. I don't think it has air conditioning, but. It is a rather nice hotel. This is their school. Uh, they had a graduating class of two this year. So they showed them in the local newspaper. The Beaver Islander showed the two graduates of uh, their high school this year. And curiously, right across the road from the airport is a field filled with abandoned cars. Apparently, if your car breaks down, you just scrap it there. It's too expensive to bring it home or something. But they had all these cars, and I, uh, my, my eye was drawn to this American Motors uh, Eagle from 1988 sitting there. That would be prized by my fellow AMC owners. I own a Javelin. So when I saw this AMC sitting there, I said, wow, what the heck's that doing there? But apparently it's expensive to get these things off the island. So there they sit in this field, like a strange parking lot from the past, all 1980s and 90s vehicles sitting in there. Um, this is the CMU Biological Station entry, and there we were greeted by Director John Gordon, whom I've met uh, on several occasions at Michigan Science Teachers uh, Conferences in Lansing, and he kept trying to coax Kevin and I out there, uh, and we were going to go, but then COVID hit, so that put things off for a few years, but we finally got there, and uh, it's a pretty cool place. This is the view from the beach. It's got a beachfront property. There's a big uh, central area for a meet and greet and lounge. This is a dorm here. Uh, this is the cafeteria, which is nice. Uh, we had some good food while we were there and it was all part of the package. And then right next door is a 2007 construction of their uh, twin lab um, uh, facilities, really nice labs at the center. And on the patio, we set up our scopes and had this view of Lake Michigan and uh, no lights uh, yet uh, for 12 to 30 miles off in the distance uh, to um, hinder our views on. And they uh, loved my uh, Lunt hydrogen alpha scope too. In fact, uh, I don't think Clues has uh, uh, dealt with much with it. He's built a lot of cool stuff and works with telescopes down in Chile, but um, the H alpha view has really impressed him. So pretty neat. Anyways, here we are having lunch, getting a tour for the facilities from John and uh, sitting in on class from, uh, from um, Clues's uh, perspective in the audience here, looking at Clues give his uh, lectures and there's my C11 waiting for darkness. So uh, we had 13 people in the class. Um, 
Kevin was uh, one of them, and here he is gazing through the uh, the H alpha. And uh, between sessions, I took a picture of the lab. So it's a nice room that we had to work with. They also have a nice 150 seat uh, auditorium in the building too. So very nice facility. CMU can be proud. Here we are uh, getting closer to darkness. My C11 set up, Kevin's 13.1 uh, DOB. And uh, here are the skies. And again, I defer to uh, uh, Adrian for uh, for these uh, views. He probably- The fact that your snapshot has said it was dark, that was not dark. Yeah. It was like, uh, it was like Perseus. Yeah, it is Perseus, indeed. Oh, There's Capella, and I think that's ISS, as I recall. We did see an ISS pass, a real nice one. And this again is probably, I wanna say no more than 10, 15 seconds on the exposure. So we can see our scopes. And then, yes. So I guess that's a good way of putting it. This is a naked eye view of the Milky Way. You look up dust lanes galore, um, uh, right down into the trees, horizon to horizon. It was. Probably one of the, it is the best Milky Way I've seen in Michigan. It really so, is. Your Cygnus region will tell you if it's even, if the Cygnus region is just as bright as that. Maybe you have to yes, the Cygnus region, Adrian's mentioning the Cygnus region was as bright as this, and you got a good Milky Way, and it was. And uh, Andromeda Galaxy, no problem. Here's the real clincher for me. In my C11, uh, the James Webb telescope gave us a really marvelous view of Stefan's Quintet. Not quite that good. Okay, but uh, in my C11, no problem on Stefan's Quintet. You know, I was looking at it and I was like, at Fish Lake, I go, eh, here, forget it. We're not gonna see it here on campus. But up there, Stefan's Quintet popped right out. So that's a sign of a good dark sky. And another real good sign, and it's hard to see in the picture here in the room, but, you, know, you can see it on the big monitor, you folks at home, look at the bottom of the clouds that are encroaching on the left. Mm -hmm. They're dark. They're not lit up, they're not glowing orange, not from distant cities. In fact, the only light pollution you see way off in the distance, I believe is Sault Ste. Marie, Canada. That's way off in the distance. Uh, even Mackinac City, Traverse City, we didn't see light domes and Charlevoix's light dome was negligible. So uh, it would be the closest uh, uh, town to this uh, of any size to this island. So if they are uh, asking for dark sky permits, they deserve it. It really is dark out there, even to this day. You know, Jack was out there years ago and must have been absolutely pitch black. Mm -hmm. But uh, even today, with all the new lights and the LEDs and everything else, uh, to maintain this darkness is uh, something to behold. Uh, so, uh, and in fact, they say uh, our skies are dark and they're going to stay dark. That's what they say in their statement for their uh, uh, request. Uh, the south end of the island uh, has some lakes, but it's all very um, uh, rustic and uh, uh, tree forests, uh, very, very pretty. In fact, here's a typical road out in the back. Uh, the uh, CMU folks, John just handed us the keys to a van, said, go have fun. So we uh, jumped in a big van and uh, tooled around the south end of the island. Here's Kevin on what's called on the map, the big rock. And Jack was talking about this too here to the, um, uh, to the guys about uh, the nature of this big glacial erratic and uh, Kevin conquered it. So uh, it's uh, even on the maps and it's alongside the road as you go through the, uh, the woods. Fox Lake's one of the larger lakes and what's really neat is that you got a lake within a lake and uh, they're quite pristine. Very few homes built on any of these things, a, a smattering of cabins here and there, but that's about it. Uh, 650 people live on the island year round, I'm told. So it's quite light population for something that's uh, 13 miles long and six miles wide. And uh, down at the south end are the uh, Beaverhead uh, uh, light, the light tower and the uh, Foghorn building that actually was designed and built to uh, emit sound for ships so they don't go crashing into the island. And uh, strangely, I I was made aware that the EMU Historic Preservation students uh, from the floor below us in Strong Hall are working on renovating and, res and resurrecting this uh, and saving this structure. So uh, we got some EMU students involved up here and they stayed at the station uh, back in May. Pretty cool. But there's the views from the south end of the island, Lake Michigan stretching out before you. If you look carefully, you might see Chicago. No, the earth's curved. No, the earth is curved. Uh, it's not flat. 
So uh, no, no Chicago down there, but uh, you get an idea. That's all of Lake Michigan before you. It's pretty cool. And uh, so that was Beaver Island. And uh, we'll wrap this up with a few other uh, places uh, if you're in, in, uh, interested in traveling north to some of these places. Make a point to stop by the Wesley Observatory over in Fremont if you're heading down 131 or 31. Uh, this is a cool little place. Uh, Steve Wessling was a retired uh, science teacher from Fremont High School and uh, his assistant Sherry Claflin um, and uh, the others in the uh, Nuevo County Dark Sky Astronomers run this beautiful little observatory. It's somewhat akin to the, um, uh, the observatory out there in Potterville that uh, uh, is run at uh, Fox Park. Uh, over near Lansing, um, similar kind of building, but uh, they've got several um, uh, mounted telescopes, including a C11 there that you see uh, next to Sherry here with my pointer. Uh, I got this thing up and running for them. It had some issues and uh, we took care of those and Jeff and Clay from uh, TSS donated the pier for it. And so it's a happy telescope and not in the picture is another C11 um, CGEM mounted telescope that I donated to them last year. So. They've got two C11s and uh, 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 this uh, imaging telescope and then an 18 inch dob uh, and a 12 and a half inch Newtonian that used to be part of the Grand Rapids uh, Observer, the Veen Observatory uh, under this roll off roof in very dark skies. In fact, their skies rival those of the uh, headlands. So they're just as dark out there in the center of Nuego County, north of Grand Rapids. And nearby part of the Crop Scott Farm is the uh, uh, pole barn that was built by Amish uh, builders. And inside of this barn, they've got our old Godot planetarium umbrella. Some of you may remember the old umbrella that used to hang in this room on that hook it is now in a barn. So the rural kids um, can get views of the uh, planetarium uh, uh, with the projector that we gave them. So they're uh, happy campers over there on the west side of the state. So if you're down that side in Fremont, uh, go down there and check it out and uh, pick up some baby food while you're there. And uh, finally, uh, we're going to go back to Fish Lake here in a few weeks and uh, enjoy some of the uh, skies a little closer to home. And you can see the fleet of telescopes. Uh, uh, Kevin Daney has a 20 inch dob now, an obsession dob. Uh, John Warren has a 15. I've got an 18 inch. This should look familiar to some of the lowbrows. That's um, uh, Old Blondie. That's Mark Depressel reflector right there. So I keep that up at Fish Lake. As, as well, and I have a uh, my own um, eight, uh, 14 inch SCT scope on a, a CGXL mount from Celestron. So uh, I don't know if there's any conflict there. It's a Mead OTA sitting on a Celestron mount. Maybe there's some kind of uh, energy spasms going on right here. And yeah, chemical reactions. Yeah, Charlie's something something bad's going to happen right here uh, between the Mead and the Celestron mount. But uh, that's my baby up there. And yes, I can see Stefan's quintet with it. So it's pretty fun. And then we have, of course, a classic parks reflector and some other scopes uh, up there um, within a 90 minute drive of campus. So we're happy with our little facility there. And by the way, over here on the right, Joe Brousseau uh, helped me uh, get my Raza. I just bought a Raza scope and a ZWO camera last fall and just testing it out, just a test shot, I got this. So I'm anxious to try this puppy out. I have not put, it's the eight, the yeah, Raza eight. Yeah, aren't they nice? Yeah, they're gorgeous. Yeah, right? yeah. We're, uh, Howard's indicating he has a Raza eight too. So uh, I'm anxious to get this thing up and running. So um, looking forward to that. And these are the skies we have at Fish Lake. There's a sky glow from Detroit, Southeast Michigan, south of us. So our Southern horizon, not so great, but uh, for uh, only a 90 minute drive, it ain't too bad. But Again, if you uh, are living close to 4.8 million people, yeah, you're gonna get some light pollution even at Fish Lake. Um, and, and Adrian can attest to uh, seeing some of the light uh, even up in the thumb. So Beaver Island, Sini Wildlife Refuge, um, let's support their efforts, uh, at least at Beaver Island uh, to uh, get a dark sky status. And lastly, uh, Kevin would be mad at me if I did not mention that the Great Lakes Stargaze is coming up. And here we are, September 22 to 25, uh, once again at River Valley RV Park near uh, Gladwin, reasonably dark skies there too. So if you're interested, log on, check in and see what's going on with the Great Lakes Stargaze uh, because they would love to have you. And so I'll finish up with this last page. 
And uh, I want to show you a picture I took up at Beaver Island. No, I didn't take this picture. Yeah, 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 yeah. No. Aperture fever. Yeah, aperture fever. <laughs> I, I was fascinated. While I was up at Beaver Island, these pictures came out from some strange telescope, and I was, I was quite amazed. Yeah, you can buy one down at, uh, at up at Enerdine. They got them up at Enerdine. Yeah. Uh, telescope like this. But uh, I was also uh, intrigued by this JAXA, uh, Japanese space uh, um, image of Venus. Um, it's obviously the dark side. You can see the brightly lit uh, uh, sunlit side over here. But uh, look at the cloud formations that are drawn out in this uh, beautiful view of uh, Venus taken recently. And then, of course, Stefan's Quintet. So with that, I will uh, end my uh, Little presentation. Share. Thank you. I kept that kept that under uh, what fifty minutes or something like that. <laughs> What's um, the best way to go about visiting Beaver Island for a couple of months? Um, you have to get advance notice to the ship, especially in the in the, the question is what's the best way to visit Beaver Island. Um, during the summer, the the ship is pretty busy, so if you want to take your car over. Uh, you can, um, uh, you're going to have to um, sign up in advance. So that's the limiting factor, not accommodations yeah. on the island? Yeah, that too. Well, I didn't have to worry about that because yeah. uh, CMU paid for our accommodations there as part of the course. And um, so that was no problem. But there are two hotels there, and I would imagine you have to get reservations pretty soon because there's not much out there beyond that. Plenty of campgrounds, but be prepared to be carried away by mosquitoes. They are just thick as clouds there are a couple of places where you can rent homes there yes real estate agencies. so just yeah. go online and be Brian rent a house or something and and yeah. Three different places. Jack, or yes there are no, v, no, VR, no. yeah there was a vr i saw that online yeah, so there was but a couple of them are actually real to right here in town we might have about a dozen or more homes that they from various people that they rent out of land. So, yeah. Jack is commenting on uh, homes being rented out there too. You can actually rent a car out there. I don't know where. I, I didn't see uh, at the docks. I did not see uh, Hertz and uh, Enterprise. It was somebody's cars or something they had there. Yeah. Bicycles galore. Uh, all kinds of stuff. You can fly in from the airport. They've got cars out there too. So I'd imagine you have to reserve that stuff in advance. And you take your own car across. The road. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. and yes. and. Uh, the question was that you can take your car across. Again, you have to uh, reserve that well in advance, uh, especially during those crushing uh, color change seasons in the um, summer. Um, cost for our vehicle plus Kevin and I was $355. Yep. Oh, really? That's both yeah, ways, round trip. Round trip. Round trip. For, both of, yeah. for both of us. And because uh, they've charged the passenger separately, but the reservation for the, the car um, out uh, via the uh, the ferry was $355. But if you're an astronomer and you want to spend a week out there under pitch black skies, it is well worth it. Mm -hmm. I spend yeah, that I money, no that problem. One. Take your scope, fill it up. and They don't check the weight of your car. The ship was listing a little bit with all the <laughs> stuff we threw in that van, I think. <laughs> um, the boat ride out was really smooth as glass. Coming back, it was choppy and a dog threw up. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I guess there was a ride, one of these rides that uh, uh, one of the other CMU guys was saying that uh, uh, all kind of about 60% of the passengers threw up on one of the boat rides back. It's not the biggest ferry, but it's, uh, it's very capable. Yeah, the waves can get very choppy. Yeah. We did some cold cruise. Yeah. Uh, yeah, bang, oh, bang, no. yeah. No. So the boat ride out can be quite entertaining. We had a question via chat early on about uh, if it's, uh, things going on at EMU, how long this is going to go on. Uh, that was some new dub workshop, I believe. Were you asking about the, uh, the planetarium? Or? I'm not hearing the question. Oh, I, I, it's the oh, one you asked, uh, Norb, uh, about the, again, the construction. Oh, he's trying to, about the uh, Hewitt Road um, down there by 94. Um, probably another month, I'm just going to guess. I don't take that way home, so I, I'm not too worried about it. So I avoid it like the plague. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I head west and uh, avoid that area. So if you want to come in to campus here or Ypsilanti, um, come in the Michigan Avenue west entrance. 
avoid that for now and leave that way too, even if you have to go east, which is what I'm going to do in a bit. Okay, and uh, what question? about the construction actually on campus? The sand dunes that you were showing, and you said that was Empire? Uh, yes, up that, that way. It's, um, uh, yeah, Empire was just south of there. So yeah, that was a cute little town. I haven't been in Empire in quite a while. And Sleeping Bear, that was pretty. So pretty neat. And yes, I got some fudge too. <laughs> Do you still have some? Let's see. What was the problem with the 20 inch plane wave? Uh, well, yeah, plane wave uh, wasn't there getting it up again because you got to spend money. And Emmett County went, uh, how shall I put this delicately? They expected to spend $4 million on headlands and they spent $8 million. So wow. <laughs> they're not having some people lost their jobs over that fiasco. Mm -hmm. So uh, and then the people that the, came in to replace those that left uh, really, frankly, weren't qualified to run it. And so that turned over again. And uh, so Joe has been volunteering his time, as have uh, Rod and some of the other guys, along with Andrew, and getting it running again. So it uh, should be pretty good. Uh, Jeff answered the uh, question you had, Doug, about uh, the construction. But yeah, the plane waves should be up and running again. One of the, uh, without getting too detailed, when I was consulted on that uh, observatory, and I was early on, I suggested that they have a, an affordable a C11, or I'm sorry, a C14 on an S big mount. That's all you needed for public, uh, you know, astronomy in a reasonably large dome on the ground, so it's ADA compliant. And what they ended up getting was this plane wave 20, which blew out the budget totally, sitting up on top of a concrete brick at the top of a building, totally inaccessible with um, live feed video on it. And who wants to drive all the way up there just to sit in a room and look at live feed video? They want to look through a telescope. So uh, that, that whole concept of the telescope up on the roof uh, just went down the tubes and uh, they end up with the CPC 11s out on the patio. So there the, the 20 inch sits. And uh, Joe, like I said, is, is getting it up and running so it will actually achieve what it was designed to do. And that is provide live video EAA in place. So you're getting EAA astronomy uh, by driving 350 miles up there to, to sit in a room and look through the, uh, the monitors. Well, I can do that from my laptop. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah, the, you can what, do that from your laptop. Uh, what's that name? What it's it's on a plane wave mount. The whole thing is a plane wave instrument. Oh, it's not one of their. No, uh, not. All the other uh, no, it's it's on one of their equatorial mounts. One of their older ones. It's been in there for, I want to say, five years now. They they opened in 2017. You think so? What was wrong with it? Outreach gesture, of Michigan. Now that they're a Michigan company, they would be. Uh, Happy to come up and yeah, probably. I don't know if they're really aware of the issues they've had up there. There hasn't, again, there hasn't been much communication between the staff up there and the, you know, what's going on. So, but Joe's a very capable person. He'll he'll get it running for free. He, uh, he he's quite the volunteer. He'll, uh, like I said, I'll see Joe at uh, Fish Lake and we can chat telescopes and what he's been doing and where they're at. So I can, uh, what are their problems? I'll apprise the lowbrows as to where they're at with that uh, when I talk to Joe. Because it's a cool place to visit. Adrian, have you been up there? Not yet. Not yet? I keep passing it by to go places north on Highway 123. Oh, yeah. Nowhere. Yeah. Where yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I used to go to a cabin up there near um, Moran, which is several miles up 123. Yeah, it's dark out there. Um, about as dark as Beaver Island, about. But Sini wildlife in the UP has got to be probably the darkest places out there in the UP if you look on the light pollution maps. Anything else? <coughs> Any other questions, questions for Norm? Yeah, what, what exactly is no, wrong no. with the scope? Joe said something, or um, I'm sorry, Jeff said something about, uh, I got Joe Brousseau and Jeff confused. Um, Jeff said something about uh, doing a little tour with his computer. We're gonna try that or? Oh, oh, with a cell phone. Are we gonna try that? Let's, let's, 
if you if you guys don't mind indulging us here, um, we're going to do a, a tour. But I think Charlie, I'll turn it over back over to Charlie to do any VP uh, stuff, uh, so we can take care of the business and then uh, yeah, we can do that. play play around a little bit. Well, first order of business, could you use an hour of overall path? I'm sure. Uh, oh. <laughs> restaurant gift certificate. You can't deny that. Oh, yeah, I guess so. That's nice. That's very kind of you. You're refusing? Uh, not the restaurant coupon, but oh, okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> t shirt. I do have lowbrow t shirts. I should have worn one tonight. Shame on me. Okay. Did you catch that, Doug? Uh, not completely. Sounds like he wants a cat. No, restaurant. No. Oh, oh, oh. If I no, I think a cap would be better. Say the guy. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll get in contact with you, Norb. Okay, okay. Doug's going to contact you, Norb. Uh oh. Thought you'd get away with it. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm uh, interrupting Charlie here for a second. I want to introduce the little brows to uh, Rosie Friend, who's uh, interning at the uh, U of M Planetarium and the Natural History Museum. So Hi. There, there she is. Pull down your mask. You can. <laughs> there, there she I is. COVID a few months ago. Yeah, there you go. Anyways, Rosie's uh, interning under Buddy Stark over there at the planetarium. So if you're over there, you may see her at the at the planetarium. In there the you planetarium go. Planetarium or at the front desk or anywhere. Don't put me anywhere. Cool. Okay, thank you, Charlie. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll try to get through officer reports real quick here. Uh, what I've got is just to let everybody know we've been working on uh, starting open houses again. And we've decided we're going to go ahead and try August 20th and 27th. Uh, basically the same COVID protocol we've been using for the member nights. Uh, so we're gonna need help for those. We have gotten some volunteers, but we'll be after you as we get closer to get uh, some more help because we need a little more enforcement than we typically would. So keep that in mind. So that's the 20th and 27th. Uh, also Westland Library has selected uh, the dates for us to appear there and that is September 30th. And we've actually had several people that said they can show up for that too. Jack's gonna bring over the 17 inch, which would be really nice. Uh, and we finally settled on the hours on that as being 7.30 to 9.30. So, and again, more on that as we get closer to it. And I'm also realizing that the year is evaporating quickly and we only have one guest speaker scheduled for next year, that being Brother Guy for January. So, yeah, yeah. How do you do that? Oh, I've known Brother Guy for a long time. We, he's a regular, don't you maybe didn't know that, he's a regular speaker for us. We have them like what, every couple of years, something like that. Yeah, 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 great speaker. Exactly, yeah, we're one step from the Pope. <laughs> so, uh, okay, cool. Okay, you might not have heard that, but Adrian is working on. Actually, you said two people. Or was that one? Um, well, that's one. That's oh, okay. I've almost well, heard two there. Low, so it's, it's internal, but he, well, sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Adrian brought up a good point too. The speaker he's working on is actually a club member. Uh, really, some of the best talks we've had are from club members. I mean, look at we just had Nord here, club member. So. So consider that we'd love to hear from anybody, anything that they've been up to, that they'd like to present, be it telescopes. Uh, I mean, after all, we're an amateur astronomy club. We like to hear about amateur stuff. So uh, it's nice all the astrophysics and all that too, but to uh, balance that out with some more hobbyist stuff, I think is really nice. So, so I'm kind of lighting a fire under all the v VPs uh, to start working on guest speakers. I know Doug Warshow has actually sent uh, leads continues to, I don't know if people have followed up on those, but he's probably sent us three or four in the last, what, four or five months, something like that. So, and most of his, if we follow up on them, they've, they've come through too. So, uh, so anyway, uh, VPs and anybody for that matter, if you'd like to speak or you know somebody that would like to, 
uh, as an example, the person I signed up for November was uh, uh, Bob Close. Did I say Bob right? Uh, anyways, out in uh, Montana, I believe, and he met somebody, a university out there, just happened to ask him if he'd be interested in talking to Lowbrow someday. And he said, yes, so he put me in contact with him and boom, there you go, it was easy. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, yeah, I will, uh, anyway. Doug Nell or Doug Warshaw sent us a link with two U of M possible speakers. Uh, I'll follow up with those. Well, thank you, Don. Well, geez, Don, you keep this work up. We're going to have to have five VPs. <laughs> <laughs> also, appreciate it. also, here's, here's something we did long before the internet existed. So I'm dating myself. Yes, I'm an old fart. Um, in our early meetings, like when I was president, believe it or not, I was president for one year. I think that probably tells you all you need to know. Um, our second half of the meeting would be um, literally pr present some images, do this, a whole bunch of different people. We, we just had an open slide projector. So if you get stuck uh, needing a meeting, you could just say, how many members can give us a 10 minute talk? You know, and, and, and make them limit it to 10 minutes so it doesn't drag on to half an hour. Um, you get four people to do that and uh, it, it should work out well. Um, it worked. It worked fairly well then. Now, nowadays, of course, everything just just goes uh, between uh, all the club members uh, on a daily basis. But uh, you you could try something like that if you get stuck, you know, and don't have a main speaker. Just just ask how many people can get give me ten minutes. Yeah, that's a good idea, Doug. In fact, I remember. Well, it's probably been five years or so. If I say five, I'll find out it's longer. You know, that works. But I remember we did something like that. We had like three or four people that all did these little short things. Uh, and it actually worked out quite well. So, yeah, thanks for that reminder. Yeah, that's always a thought, too. So now's the time to start working on it because uh, January will be our last one. It's on schedule, and that'll be here quicker than we can believe. So, in fact, I think I'm going to pull my snow shovel back out. Anyway, <laughs> so I will move on then to Adrian. All right, I'm uh, talking through the phone so that everyone on the um, TV screen can actually hear me. So a couple things, I've been uh, on the low A-ball talk circuit and talking with um, the Montreal Rask Center, um, doing a talk on my uh, landscape astrophotography. And um, let's see, Monday, see, either Monday or Tuesday, I think Tuesday, I have an outreach event at uh, Lake St. Lake St. Clair Metro Park. I'll be doing uh, solar viewing. I was fortunate enough to get the day off so that I could do, so I could do the um, solar viewing there. So as long as we don't have cloudy skies, I'll be uh, working with the students there. Um, also, um, because I'm Tuesday night will be, um, or Tuesday night will be another presentation, the 100th Global Star Party. It's where uh, Kareem and I, um, along with a few other dignitaries, um, give talks to a global audience. So, so I've got a number of people. I've just been slow to ask them if they'd be interested in giving a talk to our club. Um, you've got the editor of um, Astronomy Magazine, David Eicher, um, who goes on there. David Levy is a uh, mainstay. The uh, Astronomical League, some of the, uh, let's see, Carol Iorg is always there, as well as Terry Mann and Chuck Allen, some um, high-ranking officials from the AL. Scott Roberts himself, who's the president of Explorer Scientific, runs the event. There's a number of, uh, and then there's a number of other amateurs, like the one we pulled for black from the Southern Hemisphere. Um, we've got um, Maxi Cesar, 
Dr. Marcello Souza. So there's a number of names, um, amateur and professional, that I may have access to, uh, you know, talk to and see who shakes out and who might be interested in giving a talk. So um, that, other than that, I'm also busy with the WAS, um, and they're doing open houses. Um, they aren't doing checks, but the observatory director does wear a mask, and I believe he requires it in there in the WAS observatory. Um, other than that, um, I think I, I sent an email about getting a first place prize in a uh, recent contest for showing light pollution in one of my images. I think I I posted that. Um, the runner-up image for general landscape astrophotography was to me more amazing because they said I had the most detailed looking Milky Way of the entries. And that was a shot at Lake Hudson. So you know, imagine what I could do with some of those darker places. Um, yes, I entered it and I went through my images and I think I ended up using the same image for the light pollution category. So we'll see if it can see if it has any more legs. I did take a few more images, um, but yeah, so is that that's a larger contest. That would be a bigger feather to come out anywhere near the top in that one. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. So between traveling, imaging, a regular job and being on the low A ball talk circuit is basically where I'm at. And uh, as far as um, black, um, I don't see John Wallbank out there, but uh, with GLAC is moving forward. We're gonna be ordering the tent very, very soon. Um, the contract has been set up and I have to send the money out for the uh, tent. So we're moving forward with um, getting, you know, getting the uh, astronomy at the beach, getting it going. So that's all the information I have, Charlie. Thank you, Adrian. Jim. Um. We've done 10 nights so far, member nights out at Peach Mountain. Um, and happily, uh, I've had company for every one of them. So I'm pretty pleased. Everyone's been cooperative so far as uh, vaccination uh, documentation and masks go. Uh, Jack's opened the observatory several times and that's been terrific. Um, coming up, uh, the Ann Arbor Photo Club uh, is going to be on the hill and we'll need a lot, some help with that. Um, Jack's agreed to be out there. Um, I'm planning to be out there, but I've had a close contact with the virus and so is my wife who organized the photo club visit from the photo club end. And so I don't, I don't know if I'll be out there um, or not. Anyways, uh, the first, they set it up to be the first clear night of three, uh, a week from Saturday the 23rd or the 29th. Uh, Friday or Saturday the 30th. Um, hopefully it'll come off the first night and the tentative idea is to have the photo club members show up between 8 and 8.30 to enter Peach Mountain so that they're not straggling in. Uh, the members that are helping out, we can false like lock the gate and because they know how to deal with that. Um, the photo club people will be checked at North Territorial for their documentation. Of course, think about the photo club, they've handled things differently. They kept track of who's been vaccinated. So 
they have a list of everybody and everybody who signed up so far, as far as I know, there's going to be any, at least a dozen, maybe as many as 17 or 20 coming, um, have uh, registered with the photo club as having been vaccinated and their documents have already been checked. So the only thing really to check with them as they arrive is that they have a mask or not. Um, so that'll be fairly easy and that headache will be taken care of. They've opted uh, several um, options to uh, use members trackers, put their equipment on members trackers and give a, a go at taking Milky Way shots. So if you have a tracker, we need you out there um, to help not only to provide the platforms, but to show people how they work and how they best might be able to uh, get a successful uh, photograph. Um, Don Foley is planning to run the 17th for that event. Like I said, Jack will be in the observatory. If I'm available, I'll be up there with my uh, 14 and a half uh, star master. And there are members of the photo club and I'll be bringing, you know, their significant others and other family members. Some of those folks are interested in observational astronomy and looking at uh, and having the photons bounce directly into their eyes off of a lens or mirror. So those of you who want to take the opportunity to observe at Peach Mountain, you're more than welcome. And I think that's about all I've got. So Jim. Yes. Uh -oh. Since I'm in both clubs, I express my can't hear you, Adrian. Okay, I've expressed my desire to help since I'm in both clubs. Yeah. So I'll just I'll go where the need's greatest, but I've got definitely got two tractors that I'll bring. Great. Yeah, Brian Otimus said he'll show up with uh, a tracker or three. Um, and anybody else who has one, um, that would be most helpful. The club doesn't have any of that equipment itself, so we're depending on the members to, uh, to bring theirs to help people out. That it, Jim? That's what I've got. Thank you very much. And good luck not getting COVID. We'll call him. Yeah, you. well, I took the uh, rapid test today and that turned out negative. So oh, that's good. the PCR is scheduled for Monday and we'll see how that goes. Hopefully that's negative too. So yeah, well, that'll put me out at Peach Mountain on, on yeah. Saturday night. So yeah, I'm hoping it will too. Cool. Feeling any symptoms, Jim? No symptoms. Good. Okay, how about Dave? Yeah, I really don't have anything to report. So. Okay. <laughs> Doug? All right. I'm unmuted now. Um, we have 190 memberships. I think that's pretty much the same as last month. Um, I have since we're having open houses or at least members only nights and uh, meetings in person. I, the officers and I agreed to uh, stop carrying members you know, to the COVID things we've been doing for over two years now. So uh, I've contacted folks that are in arrears on their on their dues, and uh, 
I've whittled down, I think, three renewed so far and one declined to renew. So we're good there. Um, we have 13, just a hair over $13,000 in the treasury, which as far as I know is a high watermark. That's it's, uh, pretty good. Um, and as far as the past month, the money that we've spent out, we've uh, donated $500 to GLAC for the astronomy at the beach this fall. And uh, I sent in the money to the Astronomical League. We have 41 members out of our 190 that are Astronomical League members, which is a pretty good percentage, about one in four, one in five, something like that. So, uh, so that's pretty good. And um, as far as next month, uh, I need to send in our annual donation to the uh, International Dark Sky Association. And I just checked during the meeting, I was a little distracted part of it, but uh, uh, sorry, Norb. Um, but at least as far as 2007, we've been giving the IDA $100 a year. And uh, over that time, you know, the $100 doesn't buy you as much as it used to. So I'm proposing that we uh, up that to $250 a year. Um, it's a nice round number just because on the renewal form that I just got in the mail a couple of days ago, hundred dollars, you're a benefactor, but if you're, if you send 250, uh, we're a patron. So we want to be patrons, <laughs> uh, whatever that means. They just put names on things. We're not bronze yet. You have to spend $500 to be a bronze member. So. Well, I second, so, uh, sending them 250 bucks. Yeah. So, uh, since it's 250, we have to put it to a club vote, at least the people that are here in the, in the meeting. So if anyone, uh, do, do we have to go through the formal move and second and all that, or do we just say, hey, uh, no, any objections to sending 250? It sounds What's that? Like, so we'll take that as a motion, Doug, and it sounds like Jim supported. Yes. yes. So then we so, just need a, uh, a voice vote. All in yeah. favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Sounds yeah. like it carries. So I will send them $250 and we'll be a patron. Um, so beyond that, I think that's everything. Uh, duh, duh, duh. I'm going to contact Norb uh, to find out what restaurant you'd like a gift certificate to, unless he said it and I just missed it. Um, I'll just send you an email for that, unless you can tell me right now. Um, and um, what, what's the most expensive in Ann Arbor? I'm sorry. What's the most expensive restaurant in Ann Arbor? <laughs> well, I think our limit is a certain. Uh, no, yeah, we're not going to be paid for me. What's that? I'll contact you by email. Isn't that you know, gift certificate like a buck fifty? Something like that. Go, might, just go ahead and surprise me. $5 now. <laughs> I like We're Italian. Not be no, that's, that's all on my notes. So. Yeah. All right. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Doug. Amy? Uh, nothing, Charlie. Nothing this time. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Jack, okay. maybe you can come up to, uh, can I talk to you? okay, if everybody can hear me, cool. Okay, well, all right, here we go. Uh, we're out of the observatory getting things ready for the photo club members night. And uh, we're also for the public open houses on the 20th and 27th, uh, the club's eight inch, Mead Starfinder uh, was loaned to Stephen Matthew West. I took it out to him on Saturday, uh, July 9th. Friday, July 8th, I attended the Plain Wave Educator Day program at the Plain Wave facility in Adrian, Michigan. That was interesting. Um, what may be of interest to a lot of the club members is on October 1st and 2nd, 
plane wave is going to combine their open house with a science expo. And the plan is to bring the community to the campus with intriguing science booths, demonstration talks, presentations, observing, as well as campus tours. So that's something you might want to think about October 1st and 2nd. Uh, it's a very interesting facility. And if you have interest in telescopes, yeah, you want to go there and check things out. Um, that really concludes my uh, report. Hey, I, have uh, a, I have a question for Jack. Okay. Uh, I'm just thinking about uh, where we normally park people who come up for like the camera event and for the open houses. In that area on the approach road where below the crest of the hill where we normally park people are is really overgrown. Have you given any thought to having a work crew or the university or the, our ability to do anything to improve the parking situation? Um, to be honest with you, I started to cut some of it down, but it's going to have to be cut down more level because of the trees. It's something like where you get out and trip and fall if you're not careful. But you brought up a good point. Uh, we hopefully, I'm gonna, I'll still be working out there, but for our photo group, um, maybe we could have them park in the asphalt by that small building. I don't know if we're going to have that many people out there. Uh, some of them could park in that area. I'm just not sure how many people are going to show up, to be honest with you. And uh, if they got a lot of equipment, they might, they might want to drive it down the observatory. That's another thing. I'm not sure how much equipment people are carrying and that can be a problem trying to carry mounts, cameras, and everything down there. Uh, so it's a good point on parking. I'll try and go out there during the week and work on it some more. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm just thinking that it's, uh, it's a bigger job than one person could probably accomplish, and it probably requires uh, some more sophisticated equipment. So I don't know. Think about it. <laughs> Yeah, I, my answer to it is uh, forget all the uh, trimmers and hedgers. Uh, that stuff is like an inch, two inches in diameter, some of those little small branches that are growing. So like, it's time to just take the uh, chainsaw and just level the whole thing in the back there. I mean, we're not cutting trees down. This is just branches and stuff that's growing, bushes that are three or four feet high. Take them all down, that's it. Uh, I agree with you. It's a problem, but I'll, I'll be working on it during the week. And uh, like I said, there's a few other places we can park. And if people do have a lot of equipment, uh, they may want to drive down to the observatory, but we can only handle a few cars there. So that's another thing we have to think about too. That's a very good point. Yeah. On the park. Well, we could have as many as with just a camera cub if 20 people come. It could be 15 cars. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I agree with then you. If we have five yeah. members, there's 20 cars. Mm -hmm. So, and if we're going to have open houses, you know, maybe we need a work crew of five or 10 people showing up and working on clearing the area or talk to the university. Just think about it. Okay. Yeah. yeah I, th I think as far as the photo club goes, um, we know they're going to arrive in a certain window of time and that will, they'll get there before dark. Um, so having them park uh, wherever, um, you know, there's the also the parking lot up by the uh, radio telescope. Yeah, and we can get those people parked. I don't think that's going to be quite so difficult. You know, and these Folks are used to carrying around their equipment. I mean, they're, they're they have these thirty-five millimeter cameras that um, you know DSLRs that they've been carrying around to take pictures um, and their other photography. Um, All right, I'm ready. Yeah, I think parking them up in the asphalt 
by the two dishes is, is would be work out well for the photo club. Yeah. But uh, we've got open houses and such too. Yeah, so. the open house, at least we've got, you know, a good six weeks. So we can, five, six weeks, we can, you know, get that, the traditional area trimmed down. Yeah, that's um, all I had. But, you know, we might think about, you know, renting or borrowing a, a bushwhacker and, and just, it just doing it uh, in about a half an hour. Um, you know, that's something, you know, I think would be money well spent rather than the usual, uh, you know, overweight and overtired uh, group of lowbrows that usually does this stuff. Okay, that leaves Jeff. Um, uh, tonight we have a total of 28 people that showed up max and 19 max on our Zoom meeting and nine in person. Um, aside from that, just uh, the uh, astronomy at the beach is September 16 and 17. Both nights are running 6 to uh, 11 p.m. And we got a full program of speakers and stuff. Uh, we're hoping to do kids stuff and solar stuff while it's still light out. Um, uh, in addition to the tent stuff Adrian had, so. Okay, thank you, Jeff. And before we take this meeting mobile, uh, Norb is gonna run a little, uh, we want to say door price run. Yeah. Somebody's getting a brand new edition, a copy of the Peterson Field Guide to the Stars and Planets with the Tyrian Sky Atlas within. I, while you guys were chatting, I was handing out tickets in the bucket. And since Rosie has a pick, has a book already, she's going to pick a lucky winner here mm -hmm. at the uh, at the observatory. You folks sitting at home, sorry, I I didn't have a. Uh, we got one lucky winner. All right. Ticket six, eight, two, six, three, five, nine. Whoa. Is it Jack Brisbane? Oh, Charlie. Three, five, nine. Charlie. Okay. Charlie won the uh, copy of the uh, pizza. It's brand new. <laughs> book has not been cracked open. So. Wow. Anyway, it's a nice book. There you oh, go. but the fine print said officers are disqualified. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> cool. Actually, that's kind of funny because I was here first and nobody showed up for a while. It was just Norba and I. And he was talking about then he looked at me and goes, Well, maybe I should just hand you the book. <laughs> and I won it after all. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so uh, before we go mobile, has anybody got anything else that they would like to bring up or questions? Okay, seeing none, we're going to give you a little virtual tour of the facilities. And this will be brief, folks. So uh, just uh, hang in there. We'll, we'll uh, run you across the hall. Uh, my student assistant this sum, uh, summer, um, Miles Mercier, who is just now coming in the door. He uh, had to work tonight, but uh, he's been helping me along with Rosie as well. Um, clean up a lot of stuff that have been uh, sort of left neglected because of the two year hiatus and uh, among other things, uh, a lot of work. So Miles has been working hard on cleaning things up. So we'll just do a real quick run through seeing as we've never done this before. So it's, uh, you guys are guinea pigs. We'll, we'll be brief about it. We're not gonna spend an hour, but I wanna show you the, uh, the operations room for the, uh, observatory upstairs on the deck, the secondary scope. We'll show you the main observatory dome and then uh, uh, show you the uh, roof deck view up here. So uh, if you've not been up here, this is uh, uh, Scherzer Observatory. So let's go on a, a little quickie tour. I've got my cell phone. Look at my other, this is the north side. Actually, well, actually, can we make I can make uh, Nord's. Uh, yeah, I was going to say if you host, uh, well, he's he, already host, right? Uh, you're spotlighted, Nord. There you go. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. 
Okay. Well, I'm not. Um, okay. Looks so, like you're good. Is this everybody then? Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm going to leave okay. that running. <laughs> We're going to just do a, a brief little run through and we'll come back and spend a little more time for those folks that are here. We just want to do a quickie run through, but uh, you're welcome to stick around and uh, spend a little more time looking at things. So we'll go across the hall. That's the stairway to the uh, observatory we just passed in the elevator. Uh, before we go in there, we have to pay homage to our, our hero. Uh, he, he keeps an eye on our, He's got this. our uh, storage room and uh, former dark room. But uh, this is the uh, ops area. I'll turn on the light. Uh, but uh, there's the Alvin Clark telescope, the one with historic provenance. And uh, my first telescope there in the corner and all kinds of artifacts. Uh, there was a game of astronomy mop monopoly started here a week or so ago, and it's still sitting there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is the uh, computer that controls the telescope in the secondary observatory upstairs. And this used to be a classroom, believe it or not. We used to get 16 students in here for hours at a time. But uh, obviously, it's a little tiny for that. Uh, one of the other neat uh, artifacts in the corner there is the uh, Mac SC computer, which still works. Still runs on floppy drives. So does mine. Uh, Show your picture in the corner there. Oh, geez. Okay, Charlie. I thought you were get away yeah, I thought I was going to get away. That's me in 1975. Just like a rock star, doesn't it? Yeah, with the telescope. And uh, I'm holding a phaser and a Star Trek communicator. So, Yes, I was a nerd in 1975 as well. <laughs> so I want to run quick. I already looked in here. The telescope sitting on this massive pier. The refractor is uh, upstairs directly above this room. So that massive brick pier is your anti-vibration component. And uh, we'll go upstairs. This building was built in 1903, suffered a major fire in 1989. So everything here is new since 1989. So it's already 30 some years old, a couple of years of construction, but um, we've got a whole fleet of Nexstar 8s in our vestibule. There's a 925 that goes outside. And here's the main dome with the 10 inch APO refractor. So there's the dome slit <clears throat> so forth. We won't open it. I don't know if it's raining outside or not, but we'll go out on the roof deck. It is not raining. And here's the view. Newly refurbished uh, picnic table. We've got a mid 10 inch sitting under that cover. Uh, Celestron 8, the 925 is over here. Uh, sundial that actually works. In the distance, you see the uh, horizon that shows uh, the Fermi plant about 45 miles away, and uh, the famous Ypsilanti water tower. We'll get to that dome in just a second. The whole fleet of Dobsonians here. And the secondary observatory, which houses a nine and a quarter inch Celestron. So there you go. And Jack has come up to help. So there is my quickie tour. And here's Miles and Rosie. Over here, sure. Back over to you. Okay.
can see my trash can. Okay, I'm back uh, on audio and uh, personal. And any questions or comments? I'm not here. Here, I'm done my thing here. So Jeff, you're in charge. Okay, I'll go back. Let's see if I can get this is a view from uh, the top. Participants more. Quest, disconnect radio. Yeah, I'm not a host here. Yeah, I can't be featured. So you're doing this stream only? Yeah, it's still online here. Uh, if you aim out that way, uh -huh. I'm sure they probably can't see that. The hill way back in the distance. Oh, no, I remember. Oh, remember. That's a landfill that's being built oh, over there. Yeah, you can just barely see it on the see. right. And that's that to the south. Pardon? That's to the southeast. No, that's east? Yeah, that's east over there. And that used to be, you could see downtown that's Detroit west. right through there. But now that mm -hmm. trash. That's east. That uh, landfill starting to block it. No, that's weird. east. You're right, you're right. That's huge. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what that means. Video yeah, at one time you could just kind of see the top of the Rensen and in fact, you see that blinking light that's just showing up to the right of the mound there? That could oh, yeah. be the Ambassador Bridge. I have to see if Norb can confirm. That might be the bridge. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. I got all four of the it's a nice view of the area, though. Mm -hmm. And Ypsilanti is a, a hill. Uh, Ann Arbor is a, it's a valley, which means it's the north side. Beautiful view of campus, though, that's for sure. Let's see. The phone is muted. Unmuted. Video. If driving mode. Oh, okay. Video is added in a safe driving mode somehow. Hmm. Anyway. Well, this is anybody got any other questions? Backyard. While we're up here? Yeah. Yeah. Did you look inside? Did you shut me down? Did you look inside? No. Anyway, I'm going to sign out of the phone because my battery is starting to go bye-bye, and uh, we'll pick it up. It was great to meet you too, Tisa. Great to, well, great to see you pe people like that <laughs> while they're at home, new members. That way is too long.
Well, so yeah, if I could find some balance. Hold the balance. Say, Doug, <laughs> I just wanted to show you my. Oh. Uh, Norm has a few telescopes okay. here. Never mind. <laughs> I don't know if you can see them real well. well. No, I have a six inch. Orion Dobb City. Yeah. He's got what is it? One, seven, looks like five, eight, nine telescopes in here. Exactly. And there's a eight, uh, well, well in, the, in the lower room they had about three, four uh, FCTs as well. Yep. So this is a good place for astronomy, student astronomy too. See why I said he spoiled. Yeah, yeah. Well. So <laughs> Well, those of you that are still listening, I think I'm going to say good night. I'm saying good night. I'm saying good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, guys. Thanks for putting up yeah, with the weird uh, circumstances. A little all weird, right. but all right. So long. Okay. Yeah. I guess not. Um, we're going to get into the big dome real soon. So, Is that open right now? It's a, 200 miles off of the street line between Manchester Park and Okay, big dome is coming. If you've got the stabilization, you'll drop the shutter speed a little bit. This is a CGEM moment, which is our 925 on here. The CGEM handles the 925. It'll handle the 214 if you want to. In a picnic. Yeah. Where is the picnic table? Up in the thumb of Michigan. Yeah. I've actually thought I'd warn you. I put this thing on the beach. It's the main dome that has the 10 inch. The big guy. You've been wanting to see this. Yes, right? I have. Oh, my. The holy place. Oh, yes. my God. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a big guy. Classic fighters now. It's the four inch star fighter guns. That's astrophysics. They made two of these 10 inch astrophysics. Only two? Yeah, the other one's in Stuttgart, Germany, and for a while, oh, yes, that's right. Yeah, that's right. For a while, it was uh, operated by a guy named Norton. <laughs> really? Well, I read about that like a year ago when I went to. Uh, well, I went to uh, I'm on the, you know, on the Astrophysics uh, yeah. uh, online group. Uh -huh. I'm going to have to tell Roland that I. Oh, Roland, I got, Roland I got and I were way back in, yeah. and she was sparring. There were some issues with this telescope early on. Roland doesn't think he should. I hope he doesn't hold a grudge. <laughs> but uh, yeah, feel free to grab the tail end of it and do that. But you break it, you bought it. <laughs> that, that is the oh, problem. It's <laughs> it, it cost us $57,000 in 1991. I figured it would replace us today. About I, I was telling my wife this must be. 
know, at least a hundred pounds. Yeah. You know, somebody they posted on the um, on the group, I believe yesterday, that some somebody posted that his friend was just putting some astrophysics optics on um, Astro Mark mm -hmm. because he was going through a divorce. He put uh, Ricardi Hamner's astrograph, Kovach astrograph, for $30,000 and oh, was geez. gone within a couple of hours. He put an eight, an eight inch of also 32000 was gone within a couple of hours. Wow. This, this mm -hmm. astrophysics, classic stuff. Yeah. Sells for incredible. Uh, I wonder what we get for this one, but uh, it's, it's a nice job. Yeah, go ahead and get it. Uh, we'll poke you there and take it right up the ladder. Walk up the ladder. This is walk in the silk. Walk in the silk. Yeah. We've got an uh, Epsom actually, basically a uh, JMI uh, push to sky on it that I can use, but generally it's just uh, uh, aim it and go. Hopefully, that is where you can find it. And don't be started on the red tape spot. My astronomy club uh, students back in the mid 90s were wearing a cape ball with our stars on it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the only way I saw it. I have a person in the sky. I came up here one night and I turned off the light and went back down over the Oh, no, so usually you see more stars. Yeah. Off of the right. Here's the opposite. It's probably a star cluster, and there's a very deep Orion above here somewhere. <laughs> yeah, where is that? Yeah. Right well, there. Right there. Right there. So, yeah, mm -hmm. the, the, the mid 90s. They even try chorus, except they don't have the chorus. That's what I get. The good students uh, coming in here, they end up going to graduate. They like to take a break. So probably okay. I think it should be like a Tuesday night. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are you doing it now? Are you uh, there's an astronomy club meeting next Thursday night, so if it's clear, they'll be up. Miles are on there. Yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering about talking longer about uh, like a dam. Yeah. Uh, sometimes. Sometimes. Uh, yeah. 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 And what the truck did by about maybe 50 seconds later, we put it in the 90s and then started doing the The truck would translate and vibrate and the telescope. This thing doesn't get it. That's great. It's fun in here in Thunderstorms. Really rain pelting in the occasional light storm. We have had lightning hit the dome. Uh, there are two large lightning arresters up on the dome. It has dissipated that energy, but we did lose a, a three six computer early on. And, you know, this is the first token thing I on. The three six computer tried my lightning strike because only the water tower is higher than us. So mm -hmm. it was vulnerable to that. Mm -hmm. We had some pretty good rain. When, when I was first driving up there, I never been up here before. I'm outside of the water tower. Yeah. Well, we're talking about it's our 120 Yeah. 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 Shortcuts of length, but I'm fine here as well for guiding the mm -hmm. Now we keep universal time on the concept there. Standard, each thing is on the other one. And so, uh, 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 there's one that was there. Yeah, that is. Um, in our toolbox over here, we've got a whole variety of components, I will filter. 
So we, we expect to use a Cadillac I'd use about a Cadillac Cove. Our, our probably our most primary you know, well used I think two inch I think is seventeen millimeter. So the yeah you got to be tight for seventeen yeah. yeah yeah the bit of the piece but it's still so yeah. you know, oh, yeah. I'm curious is that is that how it really yeah. yeah. how it does I mean looking myself yeah it's fifty five cent of this that's wild. <laughs> it just doesn't look like it could bounce on two. It's 50 pounds. I don't know. I found out that I only needed one. Yeah, there's another. So this is a heat of 7. Oh, it's an heat of 7. Okay. As soon as you start, and I hate the height 4. Yeah. Uh, the lens is uh, pretty pretty. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And I mean, we're taking two steps. And then also that they have to lose a lot And then here's the dogs. There she goes. And it's fixed at severe away. They are on the top drive. They're kicked out on the original fires and bombs that we built in 1991. It's uh, they finally gave us a ghost about a year or two ago. Rather than set out players and put forth the uh, petition, my friend Emery, who's an electrical engineer out of San Diego, he helped build the fire control system for the new one. So he knows the uh, servo drive system. We don't have to play that too much. Oh, we're not going to have a time to install it in the morning. Yeah. 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 And uh, one thing we couldn't do before, uh, the old round the hot system, we couldn't swing the pulse still very fast. Sound lock is the Yeah. I'm uh, actually, that was put on a, a, a day when I walked with the public and 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 the the public and 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 the public we brought the head with straps on it, it ripped down on top of the street. And then the OTA had to take the lens off and the tail stopped off and carry it carefully without the bed. I love the ball. Oh, really? Yeah. And Bob Dustin was here. How did I get it wrong? I had to take the light off. It doesn't fit. I still can't get it. I had to take my light off a couple of days. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I literally was standing here on, the, on, a, on this. One thing you know is gave birth to while Bob Dustin was up on the ladder turning the side of the I was literally holding the telescope straight up. <laughs> I was taking the lens off a couple of times. We're trying to use the mouse to maneuver it down yeah. to where it's yeah. accessible. And I put the, the lens literally above the cabinet, there above this, and taking that out twice for a clean, and I gave the lens an M. People don't like hearing that sort of thing. All I did want to tell people this secret formula for the boiler spacing. It's nothing more than mineral oil. Yes, he said that on the phone. He's eating some vegetable oil. Yeah. 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 So I went down to uh, CBS Run, bought an animal, and he boarded an animal. And it was a week down. He <laughs> came up here one day and told me January day, and you see all kinds of weeds spattered in the like, food cabins and all that kind of thing. Sorry. All we had was scotch tape on the front. So we beat her out of the past the scotch tape. So I did take it after I beat her then. <laughs> so it's working. It's been working ever since. One more touch of the heating. Yeah. You break it, you walk up, and that's for sure. It took two years to make the scope. They ordered it, but through the 1989, they didn't allow it to summer 1999. Which was apparently according to Roman facts. I, I would guess so. It takes 10 uh, years. It took me a year to get one now. I would have accepted it. <laughs> I, I hear horror stories of all uh, OTAs being ordered and it takes six or seven years to get them. I like soap, not bad. Yeah. That's the thing we can do with the sun. <laughs> but, I'm sorry about soap. Little mm -hmm. piece of equipment, man. And it works fine in the city. One of the neat things about the street, I, I actually talked to Dr. Frank Melchheimer. Whose DFM initials stand for him, Dr. Malcolm Frank Malcolm, the DFM spoke like the one in Angel Hall and um, the one at New Lynn Dearborn and Central Michigan had the DFM 16 in there for the current group, which was from the CNU campus. Um, I saw years ago on the visit. But Dr. Frank Melchheimer said, Oh, I wish you would have talked to us. We would have put a DFM 16 in the observatory. That would have been 75,000. This was 57,000. So I'll take this because people come in here and they go, oh, yeah. Oh, you look through the console. Yeah. Five of your kind. In fact, during the Mars meeting in 2003, we had 5,000 people visit us and took a few nights. Yeah, so. We had C14 yeah. out of the deck with a couple of C11s. You know, scopes are actually bigger than this. Mm -hmm. They don't want to see They want to go queued up down the stairwell all the <laughs> way up to the parking lot for an hour and a half just to get a glimpse of Mars. It's not a real observatory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it clouded up on one guy, and he just went to whisper. Uh, Change me. Do something about that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we There's no reason to open it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He wants to see it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.